especially for people who are academics. Uh, uh, the professors you can found an academic for academics, obtuse writing seems to be of higher prestige for the author. Overall, the evidence is consistent with the common suspicion. Clear communication of one's research is not appreciated. Faculty are impressed by best readable articles. <laughs> And this particular uh, quote at the end, <laughs> bad writing, it is easily verified, has never kept scholarship from being published. <laughs> but it will keep it from being published in a newspaper. <laughs> so just remember that. And again, this is, this is important to remember. Um, I think this is horrible. But I mean, it, it, it tends to be true. And, and one of the things that um, Ralph Keyes writes in his book is he decided to go back and look at the college papers they did to see how he had gotten better as a writer and found that the opposite had happened, that he thought that the, the stuff he wrote coming into college was better than the stuff he was writing in the college. And like me, he didn't look to write for a newspaper and had to unlearn a lot of the stuff that had been imposed you don't want to sound too simple. You want big polysyllabic words. You want all of these things to make you sound like you're in college, uh, when it's not always necessary. Okay. In contrast to your insider language, just remember everybody reads the paper. Everybody reads the paper. Can I stress this point again? Everybody reads the newspaper. Let me tell you the thing that I found out that everybody <laughs> reads the newspaper. <laughs> Those of you who watch American Idol, I'm not one of them, but uh, years ago, Fantasia Barino was one of the contestants uh, and winner, right, of American Idol. Several years ago, Fantasia came out with a song called Baby Mom. I don't know if y'all remember that song. Uh, around the time that Baby Mama was released, I happened to be at uh, Walgreens and standing behind this. Uh, girl of about 14 or 15 buying a pregnancy test. She was in a school uniform, you know, kind of plaid skirt and Oxford shoes with one of the saddest looks on her faces that I've ever seen. So I decide to contrast what I'm seeing from this young girl in the context of this song that's now getting so much rain from that, right? Then maybe this song gives them such a good idea, you know, making B A B Y M A M A sound like a cheerleader chant, right? <laughs> so I, I, I write this column and I get besieged by self identified baby mamas. Right? <laughs> from my email, from my phone, every, I mean, every, every five minutes. And, and, and in my arrogance, I'm thinking, y'all read the paper? It was, it was indeed arrogance. I would think that just because somebody calls herself a baby mama, that she would not read the newspaper. So for me, that was a lesson. And if you if you drive through New Orleans in particular, you will see it. You will see people at bus stops reading the newspaper. You will see people at coffee shops reading the newspaper. No matter where you go in the city, you will see people reading the paper. So I put everybody reads the paper up here to remind you of just that. When you're writing something that you want the world to see, understand that the world is going to see it. And it's not just people who have master's degrees. And it's not just people who have any type of degrees. It doesn't mean they're dumb. It doesn't mean they're uneducated. It doesn't mean they are incapable of getting the point that you're trying to put across. Uh, it just means they're not, not necessary. So by the very nature, people Pieces published in the newspaper are meant to be understood by a wide audience. Uh, and even read pieces are to write. If you write one, celebrate that. Reject the idea that what's easily understood is something. Again, I think that's something that again is imposed upon me. If I don't get it, blame yourself and not me. Um, and this is kind of a Mechanism that some people have uh, when, when they're writing. 
Uh, don't assume that your reader is just not swift enough to get your brilliant prose. It is probably your inability to, to uh, express a thought clearly. Um, I have this on my shelf because I am still a nerd. Uh, the Best American Science and Nature Writing uh, from 2008. Um, this one was edited by Jerome Doctor. And I wanted to read uh, you just a little bit. He decides that he wants to take what's for him has been uh, a career of research and, and medical practice and start writing, kind of create a new kind of career for himself and become a writer and not just for other doctors and academics and not just for for the insiders, but for a lay audience. And uh, so he gets started <clears throat> on his cast. And uh, this is what happens after he has finished some of his drafts. My first speakers were colleagues at the hospital. I showed my three drafts to researchers and doctors and received glowing feedback. Brilliant, said one. Deeply engaging, said another. Profound, remarked the third. Feeling rather heady, I showed the three pieces to my wife, Pam, who studied biochemistry in college and is now on the university faculty as an endocrinologist. She looked at the articles intently, then fixed her gaze on mine. They're awful, she said. <laughs> really awful. They're convoluted and filled with jargon. Didn't you ever learn how to write a simple declarative sentence? <laughs> But the people I showed them to found them brilliant, deeply engaging, profound, I objected. Who told you that? <laughs> I gave her the names. They all work for you. Pam <laughs> <laughs> was right. The three pieces were off. Verbose, often tangential, filled with scientific lingo that would mean nothing to a lay reader, and on second reading, opaque. The familiar, formulated structure of a scientific article had given me no clue how to write a piece for the average reader. Here, significance was not a matter of statistics. So he has to be told that, no, this doesn't, this doesn't cut it. You know, can't you, did you learn how to write a simple declarative sentence? Subject, verb, object works very well. <laughs> okay, listen to Mark Twain. This is one of my favorite writers, hope he's one of yours. This is taken from uh, an essay that I will uh, reference later at the end. Uh, but this is just a bit of his uh, rules for writers, and it's for, it's for everybody, including me. These are things he says uh, an author shall do. Say what he is proposing to say, not merely come near it. Use the right word, not the second cousin. <laughs> and shoe surplus knowledge. <laughs> Let me get started. <laughs> Not omit necessary details. Avoid sliding the list of form. Use good grammar. Employ simple and straightforward style. I think all those are self explanatory Okay, here's just a list of words I hate, and I hope you all just don't, don't use them. And, then, and this is not the universe of words that are to be reviled. This is my personal list of words. I don't like the words never city and minority because they're often used when you can just say, did you mean poor black people? Just say poor black people. Did you mean poor people? Just say, I mean, to me, in New Orleans especially, is it, isn't the inner city is French Quarter? I mean, wouldn't it be? I mean, it, I mean no, seriously. I mean, if, if it's the inner city, wouldn't it be essentially the French Quarter, you know? Or what about like inner city people in Metairie, you know? <laughs> I mean, because I've heard people, you know, make such things. Or it doesn't. If you mean black, say black. If you mean, if you mean women, say women. If you mean whatever you mean, just say what you mean. If you don't have to come up with with code words and other kind of stuff, you know. And and, and that to me is, is part of the. the it's what you need to do as a writer, you know. 
if you mean people who aren't white, say people who aren't white. If you mean black people, say black people. If you mean poor people, say poor people. If you mean people who live in New Orleans, say people who live in New Orleans. If you mean poor neighborhoods in New Orleans, say poor neighborhoods in New Orleans. Be specific. The vagueness doesn't get you anywhere. And it often will not be exactly what you mean anyway. So I'm sure you could all generate a list of, of words that you think are overused, misused. Um, again, again, it's not an exhaustive list, but these are just things that kind of make me, make me shudder. In general, small words trump big words. Be <coughs> uh, liberal with verbs and things you can modify. The active voice will hold the reader, the passive voice will and, and understand that although if you're in public health and you're, you're scientific based and you have all these statistics to bring to us, that there is something good about animals. Uh, they can't replace statistics clearly, and they're not always uh, the most instructive. But um, just remember that when people are reading this paper, and again, everybody reads this paper, they are there in large part because they do like stories and they like to hear stories. So your anecdotes can provide. Uh, do people know the difference between an active voice and an active voice? Jarvis walked into the room and said, that's an active voice. Uh, or Jarvis sat. Sometimes it's hard for me to think of passive voice. <laughs> yes, the room was walked into by Jarvis. <laughs> yeah, you see how ridiculous that is. <laughs> okay, take the horn out of your mouth. Okay, this is from one of my uh, favorite, uh, I don't know if anybody knows that, that quote right now, but there is a, uh, a famous story told about uh, Miles Davis and John Coltrane. If y'all are familiar with those two jazz giants. Miles, band leader, trumpeter, you heard uh, kind of blue, or uh, someday my prince will come, or any of those things, you know, how cool and laid back, and how uh, smooth the sound was, and how there were these long gaps and silence and pauses, and it's really one of the things that I, I love about Miles Davis is his ability to convey things in very kind of short and tight spaces. John Coltrane, by contrast, you know, has this what, what, what critics call sheets of sound. It's just sound upon sound upon sound upon sound. So the conversation between Miles Davis and John Coltrane becomes Miles Davis asking him, why are your solos going on for 15 minutes? And I'm, that's not an exaggeration. He was, he was playing all of these solos that were lasting 13, 14, there's one thing that we call case control. So the story goes that John Coltrane would ask him by now I'll say this why his solos were so long. He said, when I started playing them, I just I don't I don't I don't know how to stop. It just gets so good to me, I don't know how to stop. And the answer was take the horn out of your mouth. <laughs> that's that's how you stop. Okay. So embrace your limitations. Um, the newspaper is a certain size. It cannot be bigger on that day to get your piece in. So embrace your limitations. We have word limits. Uh, Samuel Johnson praised John Milton's Paradise Lost and said, none ever wished it longer than it is. <laughs> Ditto for your submission. You would never get a submission. You would never send something to the newspaper. And the editor said, you know what, this is good. Because you can add a few more hundred words to it. It would be so much better. No, that's not the answer. If your piece isn't considered good enough to publish, it won't be because the newspaper imposed a word. And this is something that Terry always likes to point out, and I will point out for you too. The Gettysburg Address has 262 words. There are, there are letters to the editor that you will see no longer. And yet, this hallmark in American rhetoric is 262 words. It would not be as memorable if it were 2,620 words. It just wouldn't be. I mean, one of the reasons you remember it is because of this premise. And one of the 
things that resonate with readers is its gravity. One of our more popular now um, features in the paper is the Monday Morning Monologue. We have a, have a condensed uh, opinion section on Monday. And we're limited to 300 words. And so we've been writing these monologues or essays of about 300 words. And they become really popular. I think one of the reasons they're popular is because they are so tightly written. Uh, and it, it really moves people in a very quick. Let me just suggest that you follow some people who I think take complex topics and, and, and write very clear English. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, I'm most of you all familiar with his writing in, in the New Yorker or some of the books that he's written. Uh, I like Stephen Jay Gould in uh, college, Jared Diamond, um, although I have to say that I would have said this long story. <laughs> John Barry. Um, I, I like a, a book I recently read by Sharon Vivian uh, called How Does That Matter? And uh, even just Best American Science Fiction, like the, the case that I wrote, uh, the editor just mentioned that uh, his wife said his stuff was off. Um, this is what stuff is considered the best. So if you read it and see how people were able to take very complex scientific concepts and uh, convey them to a lay audience, And before we look at some of the examples of some of the things, I just want to give you some a couple of examples of resources. Mm -hmm. uh, the Elements of Style by Strong and White is considered the go to book. Um, and it is one of the tiniest books you will find out there. Very thin volume. Uh, I don't remember Strong's first name, but White is the E.D. White who wrote Charlotte's Run, one of the great essays. You can find this on the web, just like Google. I would say nothing, five hundred words. It is really good because it gets to a lot of the stuff that we're saying today, you know, about not being vague, about making a real argument. Each from uh, Mark Twain, my like quote, uh, it comes from Fenmore Cooper, that's James Fenmore Cooper's literary offenses. Um, and the book by Ralph Keyes, uh, The Courage to uh, I've always found it to be very helpful. And again, he mentions the study of, of other academics pretending to know uh, what uh, has been said. And read the time speaking. If you want, where you want to be published, wherever you want to be published, make it a point of knowing what they have published and what they can publish. And if your piece seems wildly different from that, I think. <laughs> It's probably not going to be published, so, so just be aware of that. You may have picked up some handouts uh, on your way in uh, of things that were published already. 